now or the survey at the end, please come see me so that um, we can get it figured out. You should be receiving an email after you check in, so just make sure that you're getting that and you, you feel like everything's going okay. Your fashion event critiques, your second one was due today. And actually, I've already started grading some of them. They all look amazing. You guys took a lot of the original feedback to heart, so um, great work. Hopefully, you guys found the experience well worthwhile and had some really cool um, different events that you attended. I love hearing about some of the ones that, uh, that I've never been to or I've never heard of before, so it's been really fun to read your work. Does anyone have questions about the fashion event critique? Everything going okay with that? Cool. Lecture prep questions, this is a reminder, you need to do two throughout the course of the semester. Um, if you have not done one yet, you can either have a, a printed out version of your four questions in which you answer one during class and you hand to me at the end of class, or if you are printer challenged, you are welcome to email me the questions in advance of class and email me the, the answer right back after class. Um, in order for me to accept your work, though, I do need to receive it the day of. So either right after class or, you know, within a couple hours of class. Any questions? Cool. Reminder on current events. Um, current issue, it's due April 4th, which is in three weeks, which I can't even believe. Um, it's due the week before uh, spring break. So get your reading in now. I will post the test a week before on March 28th, so you'll have a week to complete it. Um, just some reminders on class. Please, no talking amongst yourselves. Respect our, our guests' time. And no cell phones in class. Um, I always encourage you guys to sit closer up front, especially those of you. I did get a comment in the survey that I don't always call on people in the back, and that is definitely not by design. It's just I'm not actually seeing you. So the more you sit close to the front, the easier it will be to call on you. Um, stay alert. And today's session is being recorded. That's the last couple I have. Great news, though. Our microphone is now wireless, so we can pass it around so that your questions can be heard by the video. Um, I also got that as a comment from a couple of you guys on the survey, so I want to make sure that we're addressing that, and hopefully it will work a little better today. So many of you guys responded to my extra credit this week on Instagram, so great job following along. I'll make sure that we keep, I keep posting opportunities there. You guys are going to be walking into the final with tons of extra credit, which will be great, but um, follow along at Prof. Caroline FIT for some fun updates. Um, today we have um, some amazing guests from Carolina Herrera joining us, um, the VP of Product Development, Ludwig Heismeyer, and Rebecca Kita, the Vice President of Sales. And next week we have Geriana San Juan, another FIT alum, joining us. She is a costume designer. So those of you out there who are thinking about this career path, this is your week to get all those questions in. And a couple of you guys actually watched the new Halston miniseries which she actually costume designed for. So bring, bring all your questions from the miniseries along to next week. Uh, uh, Joanna Buchanan will be joining us the next week. She is a designer and founder of her own brand um, called Joanna Buchanan. And then the next week, Patricia Mita, who is an editor um, and director for, of women's wear for Fashion Snoops, will be joining us. So you, can guys, you guys can get a little bit more intel on what it takes to go into reporting on fashion. Um, then we have spring break, and I will just touch on week 10, which is Molly T Taylor, uh, the chief merchant for Off Six, uh, Off Sacks Fifth Avenue. Um, will be joining us that week. Any questions about schedule, guys? Just a note on the last, um, on, on May 9th and May 16th, Leslie Gifford has generously agreed to be flexible with me, given um, my due date. So depending on when I give birth, we're either going to have Leslie Gifford on the 9th or the 16th, and the other class will be an asynchronous class that we work out. So just keep that in mind, and as we get as close as possible, I'll let you guys know what's happening. But um, as of now, it's actually looking like I probably will be having the baby around May 10th, so it should work out that we'll have class on May 9th and we'll skip the 16th, but I'll let you guys know. <laughs> so. All right, well with that, I wanna introduce our guest for today. Um, Ludwig is 
As a passionate and results-driven fashion executive, he has 20 years of leadership experience in the design, development, and pro production of luxury apparel and accessories for Caroline Herrera in New York. As VP of Product Development, LH leads the product development process, design calendar, and supply chain, including manufacturers in the US, Europe, and Asia. He identifies and prioritizes initiatives, sets timetables for various product categories, as well as licensed product. LH's position includes overseeing the in-house atelier and product development team. He directs licensing partners and special project collaborations, establishing the direction, development calendar, and terms. In addition, LH manages the budgets for product development, design, and freelance spending, meeting target goals for seasonal allocations. In earlier roles, he co-designed and supervised the apparel and accessories collections from concept to final presentation. He attended Premier Vision and Milano Unica to develop exclusive textiles and prints. Performing market research, he maintained a deep knowledge of style, fabrication, and color trends. He also oversaw fashion show production, including model casting, styling, and logistics. Ludwig received his Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in fashion design and specialization in tailoring and American sportswear from our very own Fashion Institute of Technology here in New York. And he served as designer critique for the AAS graduating class in, at FAT in both 2011 and 2015. Rebecca has an equally amazing uh, bio. Uh, she's a veteran of the New York fashion industry and will forever consider 7th Avenue her home. Born to be a New Yorker, Rebecca grew up in Pennsylvania but was set on moving to the city since childhood. A high school career fair introduced her to the idea of a career in fashion and to FIT. Her mind was made up instantly. She received an AAS in fashion buying and merchandising and a BS in marketing and merchandise management here at FIT. She worked in women's ready-to-wear at the Ralph Lauren store on 72nd and Madison while in school, and after graduation worked there full-time and then in the corporate office in an administrative role before entering the Saks Fifth Avenue Executive Training Program. Her first placement at Saks was in the American Designers Buying Office, and it is in that role that she first met Carolina Herrera. In 2001, Rebecca accepted a sales position at, at Caroline Herrera in New York, and her role has evolved over the years, at times including merchandising and sales responsibilities for bridal and ready-to-wear, both in North America and globally. Currently, she's the VP of ready-to-wear and sales for sales in North America and bridal, and managing the strategy and relationships for major and domestic specialty wholesale partners. Thank you both for being here. Please join me on the stage. <laughs> Thank you guys for being here. So great to have um, two different sides of the business from the same company seated together to chat about the business. So appreciate it. Um, starting, probably starting with Ludo, could you want to just talk us through your career and how you got to where you are today? Sure, absolutely. Can you hear me, everyone? Yeah. Firstly, it's great to be back at FIT. Um, you know, I, I graduated in 2002, so not to date myself, but it's been a little bit, uh, and it seems, you know, what happened at the university is wonderful, so really happy to be back. Um, I started my career at FIT. I was a fashion design major, and um, I went through, you know, the associate program, um, and specializing at the time in tailoring, and then finished the bachelor degrees um, specializing in American sportswear. Um, shortly after, I was very fortunate to be actually with Carolina Herrera from the get-go. And um, I started as an assistant designer. I worked myself up within the design department. And, you know, respectively speaking, after, you know, a relatively short time, I became the design director working directly with Mrs. Herrera for a long time. You know, um, Rebecca can attest to it. It's such an honor to work, you know, next to an icon, a living icon who, you know, literally is in the office every day. Yeah. Um, and, you know, big picture, she really formed, um, you know, who I am in part. She was a great, or she has been a great mentor. And, um, you know, 
being part of the industry, working at such a wonderful brand, such a luxury brand as Colina Herrera is, you really um, you know, get to enjoy every day and, and, and just, um, you know, you don't take it for granted. You know, it's a tough industry, but, but, but having such a mentor and, and, and working, and uh, it, it just um, gets you through everything. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. How about you? <laughs> Um, can everybody hear me okay? So I too started here at FIT on the business side. So I uh, have my associate's degree in fashion buying and merchandising and then a bachelor's degree in marketing with a concentration in merchandise management. Um, I started working at the Ralph Lauren store when I was in school here. So I worked part time there. So that's kind of where my career started on the sales floor selling women's apparel three days a week when I wasn't in school. Um, and when I graduated, I worked there full time for a little while, ended up taking a corporate job at Polo Ralph Lauren, actually with the men's design team, an administrative role with them, which you know was super interesting. My first office job, learned a lot there. It was great to interface with the design team and kind of understand and see um, how they work together and with the other departments in the company. Um, ultimately, I was like, okay, now what? What am I going to do for my next career step? And so many people had said, why don't you go through one of the buying training programs at one of the big stores? And I was like, I don't know if that's what I want to do. But ultimately, um, I was lucky enough to be accepted to the Saks Fifth Avenue Executive Training Program, and I did that, and it was an incredible stepping stone. It still helps me do my job every day today. It, it changed everything. Um, it was an incredible experience, and I learned so, so much. So um, really understanding the financial side of the business and what it takes to um, have a successful department in a big store like that. And I'm dealing with the buyers on a daily basis in my job in sales. So I really understand where they're coming from and their point of view, and it's super, super important. So I was there for about three and a half years. The first office I was in was what we used to call American, I'll date myself now, I'm not telling anybody the years of any of this happening, <laughs> like Ludi did. It was before <laughs> him that I graduated, but I won't say the year. Um, but, um, you know, I was there for about three and a half years, and we called the office I was in American Designer Couture. So it was Carolina Herrera, Oscar de la Renta, Bill Blass, Jeffrey Bean. All of them were living at the time. It was just an incredible experience, an amazing time um, to, to be working in the industry in New York. And I felt so fortunate to be placed in that office. I was in that office for two years, had amazing relationships with all of my vendors. And then I actually ended up buying Ralph Lauren women's for SAC. So I felt like I had really come full circle there um, and understood that customer and was able to make a great impact on that business as well. Super interesting. But I was curious about going to the other side, traveling to different markets and when a sales position opened up at Carolina Herrera, I jumped at the chance to work there um, and have been there ever since. So the role has changed and evolved over those years, but many of the things that I do every day and the things I'm responsible for are the same things um, that I was in those early years. I feel like I, what I love about your path so much is it actually stresses like three different points that I try to make to all my students, both here. I, I teach in FBM now, uh, mm -hmm. which is where you graduated from as well. Um, and the first is the idea of getting a job in a store when you're just starting out, because it's the best way to get your foot out there and get your, get, you know, understand the business, understand the customer so that no matter what you do next, oh, yeah. you know that, you know that. Part. I mean, I, I'll just say I agree with that 110%. Um, now, the world has changed so much since I was in your shoes. I mean, I'll say the internet and, you know, shopping on the web didn't exist. So, like, all the transactions that were happening were happening in store. So, you know, and, and the years that I worked at Saks, our office was literally right across the street from the Fifth Avenue store. And we were there every day. And um, a lot of the people that I work with stressed the importance of being there. And I said, you know, you have to see the product. You have to be in the store. That's where the money's changing hands. That's where you're, and this is still true today. I mean, and Ludi knows.
clothes. I am like so serious about this. Like I spend time in stores all the time. I just spent like literally two days at Saks last week because you need that interaction with the customer to really understand your business, understand where your opportunities are, understand where you could be better. Um, no other format, no other way. I mean, I love to do analysis and I love to look at the selling reports, but nothing is going to tell me more about my business than spending time in a store and being face to face with my customer. Um, seeing her try on the clothes. It's such a great experience. And just understanding also holistically what it takes to run a store and all of the things involved. Um, again, it's that transaction touch point. So I agree. I think it's you know an invaluable experience. And for sure, whenever I have an open to hire on my team, I look for someone that's had retail experience. That's great. That's good to hear on the other side of things. The second thing I wanted to call out was that you went to a training program, which I think is a really great way to get a crash course in all the inner workings of, of a department store or you know whatever company. But I mean, amazing. It was it, it was so good. And again, I mean, and Ludi knows too because I talk about it all the time. It's it I learned so much, and it's funny because when I went to work at Carolina Herrera, many of the people that I worked with at Saks were still there, and now they were my, my customer. And um, the one divisional vice president that I had worked for and then was partnering with um, used to say, Rebecca is a graduate of Saks Fifth Avenue. And <laughs> I still to this day say, yes, Rebecca is a graduate of Saks Fifth Avenue. It, if you have the opportunity and the interest in, in that part of the business, again, it, it's an incredible, um, a place to learn. You, uh, you know, really see lots of different parts of the business, the buying piece, the planning piece, the store piece, how they all work together. Um, and really, you know, it's like that financial linchpin where if you are on the business side of things and you're interested in buying or you're interested in sales, I mean, that's where I got that super, super strong financial background that still helps me every single day at my job. That's great. And the third thing I want to highlight, too, is that you used your network to get your next job. I mean, that, uh -huh. that's, there is nothing better than saying you were so good at your job that someone wanted to <laughs> steal you from where you were currently working. I hope that's true. <laughs> um, no, and I think for you guys now, one of the things that I wish um, we had back when I was in your shoes was like social media and email. It's so much easier to have touch points and keep in touch with people now than it was when I was in school. I mean, you literally had to write a letter or like be brave enough to pick up the phone and call someone. Um, and now it's, you know, a little less scary maybe to reach out with an email or, you know, I, all my former interns are connected with me um, on LinkedIn and Instagram um, to send a note that way. And I encourage you to keep up those connections with peers and with, you know, everyone you're coming in contact with that could potentially be a mentor because you just never know who's going to help you um, kind of find your niche or the next place in your career. Yeah, that's great. Did, um, Ludwig, did you work while you were at FIT at all? Um, I did not really, no. <laughs> I did not, but that's not to, to say, yeah, I mean, obviously it's amazing. I, um, I did not. I, uh, <clears throat> I did internships naturally, and I can only stress the importance of internships, and, you know, especially, I mean, coming from the design side, you know, um, you can tell by an intern immediately if that person is interested, if that person really wants to persevere in the fashion industry and, and, and succeed. Um, you know, we couldn't, also us, we couldn't work without an intern, like interns are such an important part of the system, you know, yeah. and um, <clears throat> we really see them as an extension of the team uh, that, that is really, um, really important, but no, I, so I interned throughout my entire time, more or less, yeah. and uh, then I was just very fortunate, it, through an internship, I actually ended up getting my position at Carolina Herrera also. Oh, that's great. So, um, and that internship program was actually facilitated through FIT. And, um, you know, and then while I was at FIT, uh, you know, while I didn't have, or while I don't have many other 
um, companies on my resume, you know, my, my work at, at, um, at Carolina Herrera, sorry, you know, I really grew within the brand and I changed my position within the brand so many times that it sometimes felt like I was working at a different company. Yeah. Um, and also, as you probably know, or, you know, there is a lot of change within the fashion industry all the time. So to have someone like Rebecca and I sitting here who both have pretty much been at the same brand, do I dare say 20 years, but it's almost 20 years, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty rare. Yeah. But again, within the Says brand. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would imagine, but, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, within, so within the brands that I really developed, and so I went from design director five years ago to become VP of product development, which now entails a whole different team, you know, different responsibilities, and it's also being creative, you know, on a different, different platform. I don't sketch every day, but I, I, I deal with numbers and creative and, you know, in, in figuring out how, where to launch the collection, who our partners are. So it's a different way of um, creativity to me. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Um, you, met, did you, you mentioned to me as we were walking in some other maybe extracurriculars that you did while you were here at FIT. Anything that you would share as a really great experience other than internships? While I was at FIT? Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned something when you <laughs> you don't, you don't well, have to share that if you don't want to. <laughs> no, this is a program that, and we're talking 20 years ago, so it was, uh, there were many different workshops, and I happened to be part of, uh, there was a, a, a workshop for the men's department at the time at FIT, and I used to do some of the runway shows in this auditorium. Um, that's great. But that was just a fun little thing, and yeah. that's where it stayed. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Rebecca? Any um, great experiences specifically within these walls that you recommend? Um, well, uh, you know, now this is gonna, this is terrible. My memory is like, mm, my BFF from college, we're still really close. Um, she remembers so much more than I do in detail. <laughs> I wish she was here to like help me. But um, we worked in, I don't, was it, is it the school shop or is it like a separate shop that like the FBM students oh, yeah. often work in? Yeah, the merchandising shop. The that, merchandising guys, shop. So I definitely did that um, when I was here. And again, it's like goes back to that whole retail piece that I think is so great. And it's amazing that you guys have that here. So I had a great time and, and it was great to meet people. Um, but also just kind of have that, like sort of put your retail cap on and think about like, I, I still do this to this day, you know, like how moving things around and like positioning it or sometimes just the act of moving things around gets people interested. So like there's lots of little things you can learn um, in, in that space. So yeah, that's, that was my, my extracurricular that's cool. endeavor. <laughs> that's great. Um, let's see, can you, can, are you, Ludwig, you started in, design or you spent a lot of your career in design. I don't know if you can talk to us a little bit about your experience as a designer and how you transitioned over to product development. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to. So, uh, you know, coming, having the design background from FIT and then being fortunate to start working at, you know, at Kaluna Herrera, um, the design process is pretty much, you know, I, I, I believe some of you, if not the majority, are in fashion design. I mean, part of our atelier, and we have a wonderful atelier, you know, it looks almost like a classroom here. Like, we have the dress forms, you know, we have the pattern tables, you know, of course, it's 2022, we work with Lectra Moderos, I think some of you are taking that class. I had to, I was thinking about, I was the first generation FIT that took that and had to take it, it's the same with Photoshop, <laughs> may I say. Um, and so, you know, my routine in, as a designer at the time, even as an assistant, of course, it wasn't sketching every day, but it was really being involved in the, in the process, you know, being part of the color decision, you know, eventually graduating to being able to go to uh, Premier Vision in Milano Unica, selecting fabrics and working on the fabric development, and re really also overshadowing Mrs. Ferreira, who, you know, you know, as I mentioned before, was my mentor, has been my mentor, and, um, so, and as you then get more and more involved, of course, you start sketching more and more um, and, and working on the actual collection. And then when I became now VP of product development, I think what's important to know is that, you know, I'm so qualified as would anyone else with, with that, the background of the design because I know garment construction. I understand how long it takes to, to make a garment. You know, I can really work with our factories now and I can give them a timeline. I can give them a budget. I can really give them my point of view, and it, it's a very qualified point of view because I've been on the other side. I used to sketch. I know 
how construction work. I know where you should put a zipper or a dart or you know any sort of detail that's needed. Um, so I think that's super beneficial um, to have the design background to go into product development, 100%. Yeah, yeah. that's great. So pretend like we know absolutely nothing about product development <laughs> and talk us through like the life cycle of a garment basically and you know and where where design leaves off and where you step in. So product development is really an extension of the design team. Um, we obviously we work hand in hand the product development team and the design team are pretty much in the same room and what happens is the design team is responsible for creating the collection. Uh, you know, for our creative director, Wes Gordon, mm -hmm. sets the tone, you know, gets his team excited, and they start working on the collection. As soon as the sketches are done and approved, they then get passed on to the product development team. So basically, the product development team takes over the finished sketch, has a communication, and you know, talks to the designer and understands what is needed, what, what fabric um, is allocated to that sketch, and then we, and me and my team are responsible for bringing that sketch to life. So then we talk to the pattern makers, we talk to the factories, let it be knitwear, you know, or cut and sew. Um, we are really responsible in, 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 in development to bring the designer's sketch to life and, and present it in the first fitting and then go through all the fitting stages until we have the final garment in the showroom. That's great. Um, I. I don't know if it's possible to talk about like a typical week in the life of uh, a VP of product development, but... <laughs> well, it depends on the week. If it's the yeah. week before the show, it's, it's, it's a different week than the week or uh, two weeks after the show. But, you know, at any typical week of the collection, it depends where the collection is in the cycle. So one week I could be talking to um, factories, trying to negotiate costing, making sure that the garments are, co you know, costed the correct way so that when... Rebecca has it in, uh, in her showroom or when she talks to her partners that it actually is hitting the retail target that um, she needs it to sell at. So that's, of course, also a very important part of product development, making sure that you, that you develop the style to the, uh, you know, to the um, cost-specific parameters because it's very easy. And I think, especially as a student, I mean, I was like that. You can design the most over-the-top thing, you know, but it's very hard to to be a little bit more edited and, 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 and bring it down a notch. So, so I and one week I could be focusing on that and then you know, a couple of weeks prior to that I would be focusing on actually getting the collection launched, having a full picture of the entire collection in its entirety and then dedicating the, the factories um, to each piece or deciding what piece will live in our atelier. Um, so it's really, um, you know, the process repeats with each collection. Yeah. Different problems with every collection. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, there is sort of, of course, there is um, a pattern that repeats. Yeah, that makes sense. Do you travel a lot in your role? Uh, Pre-pandemic, for sure. Yeah. yeah. There was a lot of travel. Another big portion of product development, especially at Kalina Herrera, of course, is VIP dressing. So as soon as you have a VIP, you know, the Oscars are coming up. Um, then we have the, uh, the Met Gala coming up. A lot of that needs to be... Um, you know, organized and scheduled, and that's also part of, you know, oh, PD, wow. making sure that you have the manpower and the capacity to making that happen. Oh, that sounds like a fun part of travel, for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you, are you kind of charged with discovering new fabrics around the world, you know, as they come about? So we have, um, on my team, on the PD team, we have a fabric director, and she, um, uh, she has a great network of vendors. Wow. Um, she, of course, pre-pandemic used to travel a lot also. Yeah. Um, currently, um, there's more travel, so a lot of the vendors are coming to New York again. But during the pandemic, I mean, and Rebecca had to go through the same thing. We all had to reinvent the way of making a collection, of selling a collection, um, of producing a collection, you know, in production, <laughs> and, and tr of promoting a collection. So yeah. what we used to do is we used to do fabric books. So when I handed the collection up to the merchandising and sales team, Rebecca and her team would get a fabric um, book that would have, you know, a swatch of every fabric used in the collection that she would then send. We made 60 copies that she would then send to all of her vendors. So when they looked at the collection remotely, they had an actual book with them where they could touch the fabric. Oh, wow. So the fabric director is, of course, responsible for doing all of that. And at a brand, as Herrera, novelty, you know, it's all about novelty. So fabric development in particular, that's how it starts. And, you know, not to talk 
you know too much about Mrs. Hur, but when she first started out, I believe she actually wanted to go into textile design. Oh. And then she was um, persuaded by her friend Diana Reeland to go into fashion, oh. fortunately yeah. for us. But um, she yeah. really, so yeah. fas uh, fabrics to her have always been a huge passion. And our current creative director, Wes Gordon, too, um, loves fabrics. So that's how it starts. Oh, okay. That's great. Is there any particular fabric of the moment that you, you feel like is exciting to talk about? <laughs> I mean, we have our core fabrics that are really performing well season after season after season. Um, but as, as soon as we throw in a beautiful novelty fabric, be it a jacquard, be it some sort of sparkle lyrics, la me jacquard particularly, you know, it's just something that the brand is really good at and that's expected. And I think, you know, Rebecca can, like even the beautiful gown she's wearing today, it's our uh, heart print, you know, um, in, you know, on this beautiful chiffon ground. So anything that's novel, a print, color, you know, it works. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Thank you, Rebecca. I wonder if, <laughs> I wonder if you, yeah, thank you for showcasing. No <laughs> um, could you talk us through a typical week in sales? I mean, I would say same for Ludwig. Um, same as Ludwig. It's not like necessarily a typical week. There's like cycles that repeat. So the big weeks in my life are when we're in market. So Ludi works with the design team to develop the samples of these amazing clothes. And then I have to schedule a gazillion appointments for all of our partners to come in um, and, and see them in person and place their orders for the upcoming season. So that's kind of like my busiest, hardest moment is the prep for that. So making sure everything is scheduled, I'm not missing anybody. I try to lay them out in a way where I'm really you know, able to spend good time with each person. Um, it's so important. And then, you know, then, then after that, you know, the following weeks, like right now, we're still in the process. I just like kind of chased for all the orders. So getting all the orders in and then the really big partners, you're, you're looking at them and you're kind of sharing your suggestions and thoughts. So there's a back and forth. Now we just had a cancellation meeting. So just following up to make sure from an administrative standpoint, everything is done correctly, the cancellations are made in the system, every account is notified, we've tried to replace those dollars with something else. So that, that would be kind of everything related to market, which is like, I'd say like one half of my job. Then the other half is, you know, servicing the clients in season, answering their questions, um, getting them fabric if they need fabric for an alteration, um, selling in-season product that's still available, um, you know, and really partnering with the big stores on making sure they're successful with what they purchase for the season. So like right now, Resort and Springer in the stores. And pre-pandemic, we had a pretty robust travel schedule. My team would travel pretty much every week to be in store again, like, you know, spending time with the associates, spending time with the clients, bringing the brand and the product top of mind, um, you know, to help push the full price selling and the sell through. So like those two things, like constantly happening in tandem and then cycling through them are kind of, you know, the crux of what I'm focusing on and doing week to week. That's great. Um, same question for both of you. I'm wondering about entry-level jobs in your respective fields, starting, I guess, in sales. Um, you know, what kind of qualities are you looking for, and what type of work will that person do when they start? Um, in sales, I would say, you know, qualities that I look for are dependability. goes without saying. I would say that's probably for every role, but it has to be said. Um, dependability, flexibility. Um, you know, just the willingness to kind of jump in and do everything, anything. Um, there's a lot of administrative work. There's a lot of actual, like, physical moving of things. Like, you know, if we are traveling and we are doing these events, um, helping find the right samples for the event, packing them in the trunks that are going to be sent to the event. Um, so things like that. So being like uber organized is like super important. Having great follow through, you know, keep that pad of paper and make the list and make sure you're constantly adding to the list, checking off the list, following up on the list. Um, so, I mean, a lot of for me, it's a lot of administrative, tons of emails, tons of um, 
answering of questions. And actually right now, something that's a huge part of that role that's new in the last few years is the sharing of information to third party websites. So, you know, sending all of the images for a season that are on the Neiman's by the Neiman's and all the images that are on the Saks by the Saks, all the copy information needed for them to be able to launch the product. That's a huge piece of this role and it really truly is so important and impacts our business. Um, so that's a way like in an entry level position that someone is really, really having a huge impact on the success of the business. And there are always gonna be things like that. So, I mean, I would say like, no matter how small the task is, it's important. And it, you know, and it's just a linchpin in making the whole thing happen. So don't ever feel like when you're doing those things that they're not important or it doesn't matter because the, I, I appreciate everything that everyone on my team does and it's all super important to make the whole thing happen. Um, and, and I would say like any opportunity you have to have an idea and go above and beyond what your, you know, direct boss is asking you to do, do it. You know, you th can think of a way to do it better, more efficiently. Um, I'm going to do this because it's going to make this work better. I mean, that's mind blowing, um, <laughs> to us. So like if, if something like, if you have the opportunity to do something like that, do it. It's <laughs> <laughs> good advice. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, of course, I agree with Rebecca completely. Most importantly, though, I want to stress that you really have to have a passion for the fashion industry. I think, you know, it's a remarkable industry. No matter if you work in luxury or if you're working more in mass market, it doesn't matter. It's a beautiful industry. It's, it's, we just talked about this. It's, it, it has its challenges. I mean, every industry does. But I think you really have to have the, 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 the passion to go into the industry. And then, you know, particularly if you go into design or if you go into product development, there's an element of, um, you know, you have to be very detail-oriented. Um, there's going to be a lot expected of everyone. The teams have gotten, you know, smaller through the pandemic. We're all rolling up our sleeves. I think there has to be an immediate commitment. And um, what I'm looking for also, I think, which is always important because the teams are relatively, you know, small, um, I just want, I would like positive energy and good energy. I think that, you know, that makes half of it because we work a lot of hours together and having a great team spirit and laughing is, is really crucial. But of course you have to have the right qualifications also, but I assume that that's the case if you get hired. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, what would you say is the most creative part of your role? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> Um, you know, where I still am very fortunate about is that I have uh, a lot of um, access to the design department. Um, I have a very good relationship with our creative director and um, that allows me to really spend a lot of time with him and with the team and, you know, just being sort of like a fly on the wall with them and, and sometimes brainstorming no matter on a fabric topic or, you know, uh, style allocation. That's sort of my most um, rewarding and most creative um, uh, aspect. However, that said, I am super creative with numbers because, uh, you know, you have to... I never thought I'd hear him say this. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's a hidden... It's, no, nobody knew. Um, you know, I am responsible for the budget in the end, for the design budget and for the uh, development budget. And, um, you know, at the end of the line, the collections have to be beautiful, but... You know, and I think that is something important that when I was at FIT, I never really thought so much about, but it is a business. We're still running a business. And at the end of the line, I mean, the, at the end of the year, at the end of the line, no matter how beautiful the collections are, you have to make sure you're running a profitable business. Yeah. So, um, you know, working with numbers is my way of also being creative in my own way. <laughs> in your own way. Yeah. <laughs> and how about you, Rebecca? Um, I would say, in terms of creativity, um, you know, working with the stores on their assortments, and I, you know, I love working with them and and getting the perspective of each buyer, and I love that the the buys don't all look the same at the end. So I'm not like over influencing them. I'm not over leading the witness. 
Um, you know, I'm letting each retailer really speak to their own distinct personality. And then in terms of getting creative with numbers, for sure there's lots of that going on in my role. Um, and that's like, you know, how to spin things with a buyer so that they're able to get extra open to buy for our brand. Um, get that money for a reorder. Um, try to, you know, well, if you, if you talk about it this way and we say, well, this is coming from this bucket, but there's another opportunity over here we don't want to miss. Can we get some more? So definitely a lot of collaboration around numbers like that as well. Yeah, that's great. What would you say is the most fulfilling part of your role? I mean, you know, I think probably like many people in sales or, or in the buying piece of it too, when, when, you know, you really see the success, when you see the product selling to the end consumer. So on a big scale, seeing that, um, you know, the, the sell-through is great, the full price sales are strong, like definitely that's like exciting and you feel good. You feel like you made good decisions. Um, but also like on a more micro level, it's kind of the same thing. Like when I'm in the store and I see one of the pieces get sold to someone and it's just really making her happy and she's going to wear it to X occasion that's important to her. And, um, you know, a lot of times even the sales associates will follow up with a photograph afterwards and, you know, just to know that you know, we, we made her happy, we made her feel great is also like so fun and fulfilling. So when I'm looking at those big picture numbers, I'm imagining like all of those stories behind it all the yeah. time. Oh, well, that's cool. And how about you, Ludwig? Um, for me, um, you know, the design and the product development team right before the fashion show and then the day of the fashion show, that's such a huge and adrenaline and, oh, you know, rush and, and, and you really work. You know, the weekend before, we always we, we typically always show on a Monday morning, so that weekend before is like, you don't even know what day it is. You know, even the week <laughs> before, you, you know, you just, you, you, you're so, so immersed into, into getting the collection done and styling and fitting. So um, it's totally rewarding when the day of the show, everything goes well, um, when the reviews are, are you know, fantastic. and. Um, you know, that, that is always just sort of like, uh, there's a relief, but there's also an excitement, and there is a, um, the, the adrenaline keeps going. And, um, and then also, sometimes when you have a major celebrity moment, of course, you know, especially from my angle, when you know that you made that gown in a, you know, in a week, <laughs> nobody knows all the details, but you do, you know, you, 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 there's a sort of proud, a pride to it. Yeah. Um, again, it's team effort, you know, it's not one, not just one person, but, um, I think the entire team feels the same, yeah. um, you know, pride. That's great. Who's the most interesting person you've met of, over the Ooh. years? <laughs> <laughs> I've met a couple, and I, I, I don't want to, no, I don't, you know, I, it would be cheesy for me to say Mrs. Aurora, but on the big picture, just having worked with her for such a, such a long time, and I think Rebecca can attest to it because she also has been working for her for such a long time, and uh, she really is everything that you think she is, and, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, you know, she gave me my start, and she continues to be there in the background. Um, so I'm really eternally grateful for that. Yeah. Um, and uh, she, as I mentioned, she has really shaped who I am professionally, for yeah, sure. Yeah, that's great. Are you guys the norm, of, you know, the 20-year tenure, or is, it like, are there a lot of people that stick around? Um, I mean, we have a handful for yeah. the size of our company. I would say at the executive level, we've been there the longest. Um, but we do have someone in finance that's been there, two people that have been there really, really long, like longer wow. than us. Like the guy that does our IT for us um, has been there longer than us. Wow. Uh, yeah, so we do have some great longevity in the company. Yeah, which just, I mean, I, sp I feel like it speaks volume to her mm -hmm. and the way that she runs 110%. it. hundred and ten percent. Yeah, she, I mean, of course, I, as Ludi said, I mean, how, uh, how could I not say her? Uh, <laughs> she is amazing and she built a great company. She is the one that created a culture that made us want to be there um, for so many years and we're fortunate that it's continued. Um, 
So, you know, definitely her. And of course, like, I mean, my goodness, there's, there's never a lack of interesting people to meet in this business. It's, the, it's one of the best parts about it, for sure. I mean, also having met, you know, Oscar and Bill Blass and Jeffrey Bean in the early years and Ralph. Yeah. And, um, you know, but then also, like, our, our clients are fascinating. So I love meeting them and chatting with them. Um, and we travel all over the United States and meet people. So it's, it's endlessly, endlessly interesting. Yeah, I agree. And just to talk about war culture, which because I think it's a very important topic. It's great, yeah. Um, you know, Mrs. Sarah did set, set a certain tone in the office that we keep up. Um, it's very important to our president that we, um, that we continue that. And, you know, it's, and also our creative director. Um, and it really sets a precedent for, there, you know, there's no drama. There, it's always high energy. It's all, everything is always a rush, you know. But but it's all done in a very professional and um, calm manner, which I think um, it proves that it doesn't have to be full on chaos. Yes, right before the show, it can be chaotic, not a problem. But you know, it it it, it, it has its times. So yeah, um, yeah, that's mm -hmm. great. So, um, you know, we were just remarking before you guys came on stage about um, the fact that we just set the two-year anniversary of this global, global pandemic, and I'm just wondering if there's any silver linings that have come out of this for, for your company as a whole, any, any changes in culture or um, the way you do things? <laughs> well, <laughs> I never thought I'd be doing a market appointment on Zoom, <laughs> but we did it. We did four or five whole entire markets wow. on Zoom, and it worked. Um, we found a great way to do it. Ludi's swapped books really helped us out. Um, and but you four markets a year or two? Four for Four us. a year, so mm -hmm. it was like a full year. Of yeah, Zoom. so a full year and then some. So like I think last summer I thought for sure everyone would want to come in person and not everyone did. Yeah. And so now pretty much every market has become a hybrid. So I do some in person and people that you know, happen to not be in town, the dates that we're showing or are deciding not to travel because it's important for them to be in the store for something at that time are able to do it on Zoom. That's great. So mind blowing, like never would have even thought of such a thing had it not happened. So, I mean, that's great. And it's amazing to be able to, you know, have meetings on Zoom with accounts and stores out of town in ways that, again, I don't think we necessarily would have embraced had we not been forced to do it in the pandemic. So I think that's all super positive. And um, from my side, you know, our company has embraced a, a hybrid work from home policy where on days, uh, a couple days a week, if you're able, if it's not imperative for you to be in the office, you can work from home which, you know, is, is something, again, like I don't think I ever would have thought I could do, but it's kind of amazing some yeah. days, um, you know, to, to do some, you know, it's deep It's like two hours back to your day, right? Like it really is. So adds a quality of life. So, I mean, yeah, yeah. definitely I, I would say like those from my side are some of the things that I think were positives that came out of it. Yeah. Um, I agree. I mean, it's, I think it's also very different department by department. Um, obviously, the pandemic has changed so much. I mean, we're more or less back on the original fashion show calendar that New York that New York is on. You know, we were showing in February and September, um, but the way that we produce collections, that, you know, especially during the height of the pandemic, I mean, we did things that we didn't think would be possible. We we you know we shifted because the atelier in New York was closed. We shifted almost 90% to our partners in Europe who were already open at that time. We had remote Zoom fittings, again, something that's you know, not really, we would never have thought about it. However, now that we're seemingly coming out of the pandemic, what is very clear is that certain departments cannot work from home, and that's just a reality. So if you work in the atelier, or if you work, it's the same if you worked at a car manufacturer and you worked in the, um, you know, in the actual factory. You know, at one point, you cannot you know, do the entire garment from home. You cannot cut it at home. You can, I mean, you can potentially cut one sleeve at home, but we're talking about, you know, a big operation. Yeah. So there is a reality while, while some of the office can work remote, um, you know, certain employees that are 
uh, you know, working in the atelier particularly have to be there every day. Yeah, yeah, yeah that does make sense. Um, how about sustainability? Is that is that a hot topic with you guys? <laughs> That's a very hot topic. Yeah, hundred percent. It's a very hot and a very important topic. Um, um, I, I think as a brand, and I, I don't want to talk too much about it. I mean, I don't want to. I don't have too many details to share. But I think we have made, you know, some progress for sure. You know, Carolina Herrera is owned by um, by a parent company called Puj. They are family-owned company in Barcelona. And you know they have very strict um, sustainability mandates, and we are on the forefront of um, you know uh, trying to um, comply. Uh, of course, um, we have identified that fabrics for us is you know one of the most important um, topic to tackle, as you can, can imagine. I mean, fabrics are you know the majority of makes what makes the garment up. Makes it lay right, yeah. yeah. Exactly. So, um, you know, sourcing fabric sustainably um, is it, really a key, um, <clears throat> it, it, it's uh, on, on the forefront for sure, yeah. Uh -huh. but, but within the system, there's so much to do. For example, our production department, they have changed our packaging to biodegradable packaging. Our hangers are biodegradable. So many different ways to, um, to tackle sustainability. The carbon footprint, you know, what can we do to uh, to impact that, you know, meaning we don't have to send packages, if, you know, we're trying to bundle packages so we don't have so much going back and forth. Um, so there are many different ways of looking at it, but fabrics in particular are on the forefront of um, review. The topic. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um, what would you say that is um, like the, the biggest success that you feel like you've had so far in your career? Um, well, I, I, I guess it's something very personal, right? It's like my personal success. For me, you know, um, just having had the dream of wanting to work in fashion and actually working in fashion, um, it, to me that, that's a great accomplishment and um, I don't think this is the end of the road yet. Um, I don't know what's ahead, but uh, <laughs> no, I mean, in terms of, you know, career and change and the industry is changing so rapidly. I mean, obviously, yeah. I love it at Carolina Herrera. I'm not saying anything there, but um, just the idea of having, so having maintained a position within the fashion industry and just actually loving my job and going to work pretty much every day in a happy mood is, to me, um, pretty major. That is pretty, that's, yeah. that's, that's a sign of success yeah. for sure. Not every day, but not, <laughs> not every yeah. day. I'd be lying if you said it. Really. <laughs> yes, I, would I mean, I agree with what Ludi said. I don't know that I, I would have thought about it that way, but it, it's true. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful, you know, like super grateful to have um, found a place where, um, you know, I feel like I've been able to make a contribution um, for such a long time and, and sort of feel at home. Um, and in terms of like successes, again, it's like the big and little things every day. You know, when I get the selling report on a Monday and we had a great week, particularly in Saks, New York, after I spent two days there, I mean, you know, that still gets me excited. And when we close a market and the numbers are bigger than our projections, you know, again, like that's just a great feeling. Um, and I think, you know, being somewhere for me, you know, being somewhere where I feel like I'm truly able to make an impact and have a voice is, you know, really special and, and for me a, a huge, um, you know, part of success and, and feeling of accomplishment. And so I'm grateful that I've, I've really feel like I've had that for a long time. Yeah, that's great. And, uh, and if I, I'm sorry if I just may add, I think, you know, I have so many friends obviously that went with me to college here at FIT or other colleges to universities and, and people that we know in the industry, you know, and it doesn't, you know, sometimes everyone always just wonders does it have to be luxury fashion or so, it, you know, I, the industry is huge, there are so many different facets to the industry and, uh, you know, we happen to work in luxury fashion um, but, you know, just as a general note, I mean, you know, there is really, um, there's a lot of opportunity in many, many ways of looking at the industry. Yeah, that's great. Um, I, 
want to make sure I leave enough time for the students to ask all their dying questions, but I wonder if you could leave them with what your biggest piece of advice would be in breaking into the industry. Rebecca, I don't know if you want to kick off. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I mean, again, I'll, I'll just touch on like kind of weaving together some of the things that I think I've mentioned already. One is like consistently build your network. Um, so your peers and sort of everyone you come in contact with, everyone that you really make a connection with, keep that connection strong because you just never know when that person could lead you to the next thing or, or could be um, the person that you're partnering with in another company, like for me, could be the buyer at Saks or something like that. Um, and, you know, in those, keep the network strong and in those early years, like Ludi said, have a positive attitude, go in there with that sort of can-do, will-do spirit. And, you know, I, I'd say like those are kind of like in the, in the beginning, like two of the most important things to keep in mind. I completely agree. And, you know, when I left FIT, um, my portfolio was beautiful. But when I look at the portfolios that I see nowadays that are coming my way, I mean, you guys are doing like, it's like masterpieces. I'd be <laughs> completely intimidated the, the amount of the, the work, the professionalism, you know, the skill that you already have, just like, you know, pulling these huge products together. I mean, it's, it's mind blowing. So, so keep that going, but, but also, like I just said, don't be, too, um, don't be too keen on just getting that one job. You know, don't think it has to be evening <laughs> wear at that and that company because so many doors will open when you maybe start somewhere else or, you know, it's never really like a straight shot. Sometimes you got to start working, you know, um, at a different company and that, to, to get to where you want to get. So don't be too either frustrated when you don't get the job that you thought you should get or, or just don't be too, too don't limit yourself um, in the very beginning, um, you know, in terms of your entry into the industry, I would say. Yeah, that's but, right. Um, but, but having that positive energy and that, that can-do attitude will show everyone immediately that you're ready for so much more and will help. That's great, thank you. Who out there has some questions? Do you want me to walk? Hi, um, I have my question is, um, what does diversity look at, look like at your company, and do people of color hold positions of power? May I repeat the question? The question was about diversity at the company. Um, it's a very, very, uh, very good question. Thank you. Um, so. Um, we at the company, the company is very much, of course, um, um, focused on this uh, topic. Uh, we have, uh, for example, two employee resource groups that tackle that particular subject. One of them is called CARE, um, and one of them is called PRIDE, which I'm actually the founder and the, um, the organizer. It's the proud, represent proud representation of um, inclusivity, equity, and diversity. And if we foster a very open work environment in this particular um, employee resource group for the LGBTQ plus community. Um, and the, and uh, the, the founder of the, um, the other ERG, the CARE ERG, is really focused on diversity at the workplace um, in terms of um, not so much focused on the LGBTQ, but rather on racial diversity um, and making sure that we have, you know, an equal opportunity workplace for everyone. Do you want to add to that? How many employees are um, in the company? <laughs> roughly. <laughs> Around a hundred, roughly. Around a hundred. Yes, yes. and, but, and then your parent company is... Yes, I mean, I don't, I don't, we don't have numbers on that, but our yeah. parent company... They also own uh, Paco Rabanne in terms of fashion, Paco Rabanne, Nina Ricci, Dries Van Noten, um, Jean-Paul Gaultier, and us. Ah, 
Wow. Yeah. Wow, yeah, so that's a lot. It's a large. Mm -hmm. uh, um, your office is solely based here, or is, is it Barcelona? Our headquarters is on 37th and okay. 7th. Yeah, okay. we are in so New York Garment here. District, mm -hmm. yeah. based fashion house, yeah. Yeah. Can you, I don't know if you can touch on this, but do you know much about the culture of, the work-life culture in Barcelona as, and how it's different from here? And you guys have both worked in New York the whole time, so I don't know if yeah. it's relevant. I mean, but. I think in general the European approach is slightly different than the U.S. approach. I had to get too used to that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, you know, I can only say that within the company of Carolina Herrera in New York, we really strive to create a work-life balance. Yeah. I think it's also up eventually to the individual to try to establish that. Obviously, it depends on workload and all of that, but um, uh, it, it works very differently than, than what happens in Europe, yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Did the microphone get passed along? Or could it be? <laughs> Anyone up near the top have a question before it comes down? If you could just pass it in that aisle, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, my question is regarding fashion design garments. So when you're designing garments for, could you, for special events, how do you focus to make sure there's a signature uh, signature of the brand as well as personality of the celebrity both in the garments? How do you capture both in the garments while designing it? Um, uh, thank you for the question. I, I think that the fact alone that the garment will be designed by, in the past, by Mrs. Herrera or currently by, um, you know, by our creative director who represents the brand, um, you know, his signature alone will guarantee that there is a continuation of the brand signature and, and you know that's very identifiable to the brand just because you know he, he sort of is the brand and he you know him having designing it makes it that. Uh, of course there's a very strong collaboration between him and the celebrity so that um, you know he will make sure that that um, any sort of wishes or aspirations from the celebrity will also be taken into um, you know, into, into mine, but, um, you know, it, it is a really collaborative effort on both parties, yeah. And it's not always just one sketch, you know, it, it, it can take a little bit more than that. Got it. I have just another question. So when a new person comes for an interview and you look at their portfolio, do, like, is it the person's personality in the portfolio, their aesthetics that you look for, or your company's aesthetic in their portfolio that you look while you're hiring people? or or just for internships? What do you look for in it? I mean, in terms, you know, if, when we have, a, when I have an open position, I think it's a combination of both, to be quite honest. Obviously, your skill set, you know, your talent, your, um, you know, your aesthetic, your aesthetic on, on page, the, the way you sketch, what, you know, what you sketch has to be, you know, working for the brand. Um, and then in addition, of course, I look, but I believe that extends to Rebecca too, as we have, you know, very, uh, the, the teams are relatively small, so we want to make sure we find the right member that is a team player with the rest. So, um, you know, it is a combination both of your, your skills and your talent uh, in addition to your, um, your overall demeanor, if you wish. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Who's next? Hi, uh, my question is for Rebecca. Um, Professor, I'd mentioned you worked in the bridal department a little bit, and I was curious as to if you think the wedding industry is dying, and if so, um, how are professionals or designers kind of adapting to remain like relevant, especially with like the new emerging trends of like non-traditionalism in like women wearing for, instead of like gowns? Well. Um, we are experiencing a major bridal boom this year. 
So if you, if you check it out on the internet, I think it says like there are gonna be more weddings in the United States this year than there have been since 1984. Wow. Um, and, and it's been great for our business. So both the bridal business, they're super busy. Um, and we've seen a return to opulent gowns, sort of the more traditional gowns embellished um, you know, it seems like people are really wanting to go all out for these weddings that have maybe been postponed one or two times already. So like the idea that they're really going to happen, I feel like people are sparing no expense, so to speak. Um, so we're seeing some of those higher ticket gowns like really turning fast right now. So I feel like whereas maybe pre-pandemic, a lot of what you were mentioning was happening and so you know we would try to have a breadth of offer from those really opulent gowns down to something that almost felt informed by our ready to wear collections a little bit more turnkey not so serious um but right now i mean definitely we're having this moment and we're it's having an amazing halo effect on our ready to wear business as well mother of the bride mother of the groom is basically the bane of my existence on earth right now. Like all I do is get calls for gowns all day long. Um, so again, it's just been phenomenal and people going to weddings and all of the events surrounding the wedding. One of the trends that we've seen emerge um, pre-pandemic and certainly has gotten stronger recently are you know, girls really wanting to wear white for all of the events surrounding the wedding, from the showers to the engagement parties to the, everything they do at the bachelorette weekend. Um, so we started developing what we call the little white dress collection, and we show it with our resort collection every year, and those really are sort of off-the-rack offerings of really fun pieces in white kind of targeting um, the bride. So. Right now, um, I think we're in a great place. Like we're definitely seeing a strong uh, trend back to the traditional gown, but we'll always still have those sort of easier, more ready to wear informed pieces. And now also this whole new, um, you know, party dress collection as well. Cool, I also kind of had one more question. Um, what kind of advice or direction can you give to somebody who, who wants to like start their own bridal brand or business? I mean, gosh. Um, well, you know, bridal's definitely a different specialty business. Um, whereas, like, for me, in Ready to Wear, um, a lot of our partners are large corporations. Just one of the things to know about bridal is it's, you know, you're really dealing with a lot of independent retailers, which is a little bit different. Um, so, you know, I guess, I guess I would say like, maybe you want to do an internship in one of the, one of the great retailers in New York, um, just have the experience of the FaceTime with a bride. Again, it's a whole different experience than selling a ready to wear piece. Um, and, and I think that would be an amazing experience just to kind of, again, understand that transaction, like, and what's all involved. And then I think, you know, developing your own brand signature and, and again, like looking for the right partners to do business with. Cool, thank you. Sure. Thank you. Hi, um, my question, I actually have a question for each of you. My first question surrounds kind of um, your campaigns when it comes to new seasons and new markets. Who is usually in charge of the the design of the campaigns and like is the creative director have the vision for it or do you kind of collaborate with the creative director to do that for each campaign and you know e-commerce shoot i mean i personally i don't think either of us are directly involved unless they need the atelier to make something special for it and then often ludi is but i would say it's certainly you know related to the creative director's vision um, and he would be collaborating with our president as well as the marketing team um, to really kind of decide what the messaging and the visual um, message is going to be for the season. Thank you. Who's next? There's one, two rows down maybe. <laughs> Thank you.
And hi, um, how, I, I'm sure like there are so many like iconic pieces from your brand, but um, I'm wondering if um, there's any change throughout the history for your, um, one of the most sold item in terms of like marketing and advertisement? The question is what, what is the best selling item? For? And like how do you do your like approach? How do you market and, it and push it in a bigger way? Like advertisement. Um, I would say, you know, I, I think the most sort of um, iconic item for the brand is really the white cotton shirt. Like when you picture Mrs. Herrera, everybody pictures her in the white shirt. Um, so it's definitely something that we try to offer every season and the creative director and design team work hard to give us new um, versions and iterations of that every season. Um, and it's certainly something that we feature in our digital messaging and that, you know, my biggest accounts rely on us to have. We definitely have a following for it. We have clients that are looking for those every season. So again, in the partner marketing that we do with our largest accounts, like that's something that would often be a part of it. Um, so I think, you know, that would be something fun to look at, kind of, you know, the, the evolution of the white shirt. And for sure, you'll see tons of them um, if you look at our big partner websites. Thank you. Hello. Uh, thank you guys for being here. Um, Ludwig, earlier you mentioned that um, we were meant, we were talking about sort of the approach to, to working in Europe as opposed to here. Um, some of us may be fortunate enough to consider studying abroad or, or spending time abroad, but New York is also very re resourceful and um, inspirational in a way in terms of design and et cetera, et cetera. Um, more particularly, how was, what was the approach or what was different in the approach or uh, what was that adjustment like or what benefits or drawbacks would, you know, did you face in Europe as opposed to here? Um, you know, may, would it be beneficial to stay for, for some time or to experience more in a quicker amount of time? Thank you for the question. I actually um, started enrolling at Polymoda in Florence, the um, uh, partner of the school with FIT. And um, at that point, I had already lived in Florence for two years. And then I realized I had the chance of studying, you know, starting from like starting my full four years here in New York, and I was like, oh my god, I'm gonna jump on this chance. Um, Florence is beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Don't get me wrong, but it was too small for me at the time. I mean, and then given New York, it's like you know, for me, it was you know, just just everything. So. Um, you know, I, I do think obviously they are super, I mean, the, you know, the, the French fashion houses, the Italian fashion houses, I mean, you know, fashion lives on both sides of the ocean. So I think it, it is whatever works for you at the time, you know, where I think sometimes the approach that an American brand does might be more, um, you know, might be more, or American Fashion Week might be slightly more commercially driven, whereas European Fashion Week might be a little bit more, you know, there might a little bit sometimes be more of a little bit of a dream or, you know, but overall I don't, you know, I think that wherever you feel home at the moment or whatever brand you feel connected to or way of life you feel connected to, you know, for me now when I have my friends in Europe say, oh my God, we're gonna take the summer off in August, you know, I'm like, mm. <laughs> I don't know what that feels like, um, <laughs> yeah. but it doesn't matter to me. Like, you know, I, I don't see it as a shortcoming in the U.S. that we maybe don't have the full summer off. Um, therefore, we live, you know, to me, New York right now, you know, has been home for almost almost 30 years now. Wow. So, um, you know, I um, I think it's really like an individual and personal approach. Um, where, are you, where are you from originally? I'm German originally. From Germany, yeah. yeah. I'm, from, I'm from Hamburg, Germany, so. Yeah, mm -hmm. but did, you've never worked there because you I've never came worked. to study here and stayed. Uh, correct, yeah. yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I hope that answered your question, I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, straight right behind you. <clears throat> thank you. I have a, a sales question. Um, specifically for e-com, 
Do you ever um, wish, I guess like Bergdorf or Saks, if they buy something exclusively for them to the point where you can't sell it on Carolina Herrera's website, um, do you ever like, is that difficult to be able to have it exclusive to one retailer? Um, typically, if we do that, which we do have a number of things, again, if you want to check out Neiman's and Bergdorf's right now, we, we celebrated the 40th anniversary of the company this past year. And so we actually developed an exclusive group for Saks and then an exclusive group for Neiman's and Bergdorf's as part of the celebration of our anniversary and our longstanding partnerships with them. Um, so typically, if we do an exclusive, it's developed with the idea that it will be exclusive oh, okay. for one of them. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and, and generally, it makes sense, and we're happy to see them, you know, be successful with it. Um, again, I love being able to do things like that where, you know, we're really able to help differentiate one from the other. Like, I even love when we offer a gown and they all pick a different color. You know, so they don't all have, like, if you walk into the Herrera shop at Saks and then you walk into the Herrera shop at Bergdorf's, they don't have exactly the same thing. Like, there's definitely a reason to go to both. You know, that's kind of, and same thing with the websites. You know, so, so I love that. And so, yeah, we definitely do develop, what, when we do an exclusive, it usually starts out to be born as an exclusive. So we do exclusives for our retail stores as well. So there would be things that would be found on carolinaherrera.com that you couldn't find on the others mm -hmm. just as well. Does the direct-to-consumer fall under you? Or do you um, no. actually sell to them? No, no, no um, it doesn't. So, I mean, again, we're a small group, so I have awareness kind of of what's going on with that. But, I mean, the whole e-commerce thing is just totally fascinating. And, I, I mean, when I can't sleep at night, I'm on, like, Saks, Neiman's, and Bergdorf's.com, like, checking our page to make sure everything's there and everything looks the way it's supposed to. Um, it's it's just mind blowing the amount of business that we're doing digitally. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, another COVID silver lining, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where else? Um, down here in the pink. Hi, um, I had a question of what are the steps to become um, a creative designer, like of a brand. Thank you. What, what are the steps to becoming a creative designer? Or, creative I'm sorry, creative director. Oh, creative, sorry. Yeah, of course. Every designer is creative. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. Hopefully <laughs> um, you know what? Uh, it's a great question. I think everyone has a different path. You know, I don't think there's one, um, I don't think there's one straight answer to that. Uh, you know, generally speaking, you know, um, you, you, you work your way up, you, you know, generally speaking, um, because you also need, I think, a great creative director has the experience to really understand how the full team functions and um, what needs to happen in order to make his, his or her collection be a success. Um, but everyone has really a different path to it, you know. Garment, you know, garment construction, I think, is very important. But then again, also, if you look at Mrs. Herrera, you know, she herself didn't have, though she has an honorary doctorate degree of FIT, you know, um, you know, she started her path very differently also, you know, with her passion for fashion by being an icon already herself at her time and being able to prelay that into building, you know, her own fashion um, empire. So, again, everyone sort of has their own path yeah. to it, um, but... Um, yeah, I mean, generally speaking, I think it's really like, you know, working your way up the ladder, to be honest. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions out there? Um, back behind you. Thank you. Hi again. Uh, I have a question. So how do you decide in which fashion week you would present the garments. Is it like you get an invite from maybe the organizers of Paris Fashion Week or New York Fashion Week, or is it where your atelier is based? That's how you decide where you want to present. 
And how do you decide uh, the aesthetics? Because Paris has a different fashion altogether. New York's fashion is different. London's different. So how do you decide that? Thank you. I think I understood the first part of the question, I mean, where we decide to show our collection. I'm not quite sure I understood the second part. I apologize. But the first part is that typically um, the every fashion house more or less shows um, where their base is. So we are showing in New York because we're based in New York. Um, you know, Chanel would show in Paris because they're based in France. Of course, you have some um, you know, anomalies. You have, I, I believe, Jill Zandra, though it's a German fashion house that shows in Milan. Um, you know, so there are um, a couple of um, exceptions, but typically I believe the rule is you, you show where your base is. Um, and Rebecca, however, oftentimes will take the collection after we showed it during the main fashion weeks in New York. She and her team will often take it on the road um, domestically. Um, and then we have an international team who will take it um, internationally um, to represent it to our buyers for VIP events. Um, but this is always after the collection has officially mm -hmm. been premiered during the major fashion weeks. Got it. Uh, and another supporting question. As young designers uh, who have started their own brands, how do you score an invite to these fashion weeks to showcase your collection? I'm going to give this to Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> If you need someone to sell it, you can call me. No, um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I would say, you know, once you're established, it's again about building that network of, you know, the CFDA and the team that puts the fashion show calendar together. I'm not sure, you know, what's required to get on the calendar, of course, but like that's the arm that kind of organizes New York Fashion Week. So I think once, you know, you have your company, if you had a company up and running, you would want to be connected to them um, and they would be the ones that would help you get a slot um, during the week. Um, just on a little anecdote, post 9-11, no, just because it kind of fits into your question, post 9-11, um, you know, Kalina Herrera, our office, we have a very, very large showroom, and post 9-11, I believe Mrs. Herrera opened her showroom to students to show their collections because there was so little space for them to show wow. anywhere. Um, I, I wasn't at the brand yet, but I know that that's more or less... More or less I was there. You were there. <laughs> <laughs> I was there. So I was there on 9-11. And, you know, since he brings it up, so now I'm going to tell a story about it. Um, <laughs> So our fashion show was Monday. So we had our show. And then 9-11 happened on Tuesday. Um, so it, it wasn't just students. It was other brands because, you know, people didn't know if it was safe to gather in these large spaces and things. And, and honestly, it was like maybe not even that week, but the following week, because I can remember the week of, we would go to the office and a lot of times we would leave because they'd be like, there's a threat against the Empire State Building right there, Penn Station right there. Um, so we were all like kind of fleeing to the Upper West and the Upper East Side because it felt like it was a good place to be. But we did host um, some shows in the showroom right after. I mean, I remember it. It was, it was great and people were so grateful. And in fact, then were you there for the next show that we did in the showroom? So then the following season, we actually had our own show, um, real runway show in our office. Yeah, he wasn't there yet. But I was there for that, too. So. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. For a luxury brand like yours, um, when you conduct like fashion shows, is it really to sell your dresses which you showcase in it, or is it just a medium to advertise your products? Oh, we sell the dresses. <laughs> we sell them. Yeah, no, um, I think, you know, it's a twofold situation. It's to promote the brand and elevate the the brand in the minds of the consumer, certainly, but we definitely sell our show. Um, and, and the pieces that you see on the runway are going to be available at my best friends, Neiman, Sachs, and Bergdorf's, um, and of course on carolinaherrera.com. But um, no, we really, I mean, it is a vehicle. We, these are the clothes that we sell, these really elevated, incredible, amazing, um, 
special pieces and our clients are looking for them and they do buy them. Thank you. I think way in the back, if you're able to pass it back that far. Thank you. My question is for Ludwig. Um, as a junior fashion design uh, major, I wanted to know if working in the industry right outside of school, if you, if it lived up to your expectations or maybe it didn't quite meet them or if your um, education at FIT allowed you to feel prepared and ready for conquering the industry and taking it heads on. Thank you, that's an excellent question. Um, generally speaking, I wanna say that FIT prepared me 100% for the industry in terms of technical skills. Um, in terms of, um, so I really, and I, be, I believe that this is still the same case now, like I really had that knowledge about draping, pattern making, you know, really the technical skills were 100%. Uh, what I felt, it's not a letdown, but what I felt like, you know, I thought I would get a job and I would be sketching every day. Um, coming out of school. <laughs> Sorry, maybe that was a little na naive, but, um, and that's not the case. At least that wasn't the case for me, but I believe that's not the case for most people. I think, you know, um, you, when you first start getting, you know, becoming an assistant designer, um, you know, you, your job will really be to support the design team, whatever that may be. You know, you might, buy, you might be out in the garment district finding the perfect trim, familiarizing yourself with the, all the button places, all the ribbon places, you know, everything that's around, um, let's say if it's a New York-based house you're going to. Um, uh, but, you know, for me it was just really about managing my own expectations at the time. Uh, I, I knew I was at the right place, I just knew I had to like take it down a notch from where I thought I would just be, you know, coloring and everything and sketching. Um, but long term, I do realize that you know, the education that I received here definitely um, set me up on the right path for sure. Thank you. Just to your um, left. What are some funny incidents that you have experienced in your career and what did you learn from it? Funny incidents? Yeah, like hilarious. <laughs> like hilarious. <laughs> I'm gonna give this to Rebecca too. <laughs> I don't know what we're allowed to share. No, um, <laughs> if I, I could get my phone and show you like a whole reel of photos. <laughs> I mean, we definitely, I'm just trying to think, we definitely have a ton of fun. Like I, I mean, the, the team that I had uh, a few years ago, I mean, I, people would be like, are you guys getting anything accomplished? Because you're in hysterics like all day long, two guys, Brian and Brian. Um, and, and we just, um, so we're cracking each other up all the time. But I, I'm trying to think of like one good story. I don't know if I can, if anything comes to mind. How about you, Ludi? Uh, you know, I mean, the, the, the funniest moments that happened in my <laughs> past so far is literally those weeks or the weekend leading up to the show. Everyone is sort of, you know, in a state of, you know, beautiful delirium. Everyone is exhausted. So you're just kind of like making like, you know, um, I don't know, it, it, the, whole, the whole idea of just working through the weekend and so just makes it um, a surreal experience, which, which it in itself makes it, you know, it's not maybe funny, it's maybe not the right word, but it, it creates moments for sure. <laughs> um, and yes, otherwise there are other instances, but I don't think it's appropriate to talk about. <laughs> but thank you for the question. <laughs> I... I know someone in college that was asked that question on an interview, tell me a funny story about yourself, and he had nothing. He like couldn't come up with anything. And then he went home that evening and was, was sitting on the toilet when a raccoon fell through the ceiling onto his head. <laughs> and he was like, oh, where was that yesterday? Yeah. <laughs> that would have been a perfect story for my interview. Yeah. So everybody have a funny story yeah, ready you gotta get for your, your funny interview. stories yeah, ready. ready. I mean, I, I like I said, I got a whole like goof reel of life. <laughs> I don't know which which we could uh, share. But. Yeah. <laughs> Make sure it's a PG. Yeah, it's a PG exactly. funny story. <laughs> Any last questions? 
All right, well, thank you both for being here. This was amazing, and it was really great to hear the two sides of the business, two together, I think, and how you guys come together and obviously work so well together and um, have such a great rapport. <laughs> so it was great Thanks to see. Thanks for coming. Students, I just have um, a quick survey for you guys, so I'm gonna throw that up and email it out to you. Um, and I don't know if you guys have a moment or two to stick around if there's any Sure. Personal questions. Thank you so much, everyone. You Thank guys were great. You. Thank you. All right, guys. So I will see you next week with um, Jariana San Juan. Treat to have two weeks of FIT alums joining us. And um, here is our survey, which I will email out to you.